And I'm Lisa. And we are so glad that you found our website, Marriage Rocks. We hope that the resources we provide and some of the ministry we're able to have will be an encouragement to you. Scott and I met in college and we were married on August 20th, 1988, and we have three beautiful children, Lindsay, Ashley, and Josiah. We've also had the privilege of being in pastoral ministry for over 27 years. Uh, I was a youth pastor, an associate pastor, as well as a uh, lead pastor. And I think one of the strengths of our ministry has been working together as a husband and wife team in ministry. And even when our kids came into the picture, they've joined us as we've been able to serve together as a family. But one of the growing burdens on our hearts has been marriages. You know, it's easy to get married, but it's a lot harder today to stay married. And we want marriages not just to survive, but to thrive. And that's why we developed Marriage Rocks. It's interesting also, the first human relationship that God created was marriage. He created Adam and Eve. You can read about it in Genesis chapter two. And in fact, the Bible starts and ends with a wedding. And we think that's really significant because it means that weddings and more importantly, marriages are important to God. He is for your marriage. Our mission statement is to encourage, equip, and inspire couples to a radically successful marriage. So how do we accomplish that? Well, one of the resources is our book, Marriage Rocks, and we hope that you'll be able to access that. And we know you can through our website and also read the introduction if you're interested. But also through teaching and speaking opportunities, we love to meet with groups, uh, whether it's retreats or conferences, one day events or weekends, even men's and women's events. Uh, we love to meet new groups of people and encourage them with biblical principles that will help them have a radically successful marriage. So God bless you. He's for you and for your marriage. And so are we. A video on our website, which is being launched this week. So we wanted to give you guys a preview of that. God is doing some really cool things. And uh, we are so excited. And just thank you for your prayers and just supporting us uh, as we inch uh, each week, each month, with opportunities to serve God and to encourage uh, marriages. If you have your, your Bibles, though, would you take them and turn to the book of Ezra, chapter 3? And for the, those of you that are maybe a little new to Bible study, you're going to find that in the Old Testament. You're going to find it partway through, before the middle section, just before Psalms. Uh, you're going to find uh, the book of Ezra. And uh, Pastor started the series last week, and we're going to continue by looking at uh, chapter 3 today. Also in your bulletin is a set of notes. And uh, let me just start by saying that, you know, today's message is really about that word you see at the top of the screen, rebuilding, or the top of your notes. Rebuilding. How many of you have ever, uh, if you've had a home, you know, you have had something that needed to be rebuilt? Can I see your hand? Any of you? Yeah. I remember when we moved into our house, it was our first house we had the privilege of purchasing in uh, 1998 uh, over in Fairless Hills, the same house we live in today. But I remember when we first moved in, that night we slept, it was our 10th wedding anniversary, August 20th, 1988, and uh, so we were now there in 98. We're sleeping on a mattress on the floor, somebody had our kids, you know, we had tons of boxes and some furniture that we had just kind of moved in, but not everything was set up yet. And uh, overnight, and actually into the early the next morning, it started to rain, and it started to pour rain. I remember getting up in this beautiful new house, walking out into the foyer, and in our foyer, some of you have seen it, there's a brick wall, and water was just cascading down the wall. It looked like a, it looked like a nice little waterfall. That was not, you know, like an effect that we were supposed to have, okay? That was a problem with the roof. And so our first rebuilding project when we moved into this house was, guess what? The roof had to be replaced. And uh, all of us, if you've had the privilege of owning a home, uh, have had rebuilding projects in your home. And throughout history, there's been a lot of rebuilding projects. You think about after the Civil War, for instance, when the North and the South, and in some cases, brother shooting other brothers, you know, in this horrible war over slavery, uh, but an important one, um, the nation had to rebuild after that, that war. And Abraham Lincoln was, of course, a big leader through that. And then his assassination, and we had to rebuild, and we had to heal from that. You think of World War II and how much of Europe and Japan was decimated, you know, after, after that war and had to be rebuilt. So the Johnstown flood, not far in Pennsylvania. 9-11, uh, of course, there was a lot of rebuilding that had to take place after the terrorist attacks. And uh, Katrina, you know, uh, down in Louisiana, Haiti, 
uh, is constantly as a nation having to rebuild after earthquake, after earthquake, after earthquake. And, um, and so we know that rebuilding is sometimes a part of life, and there's a lot of physical projects that have to be taken on. But the fact is today what we want to talk about is rebuilding spiritually. Because the nation of Israel had to rebuild their relationship with God. Because they were in captivity for many years, 70 years actually, before they were going back to their homeland to rebuild. And um, in your notes, I just want to share with you a couple things. And that is, number one, that we all have areas in our lives that need rebuilding. We all do. Maybe the house uh, uh, representing your life, maybe it's not all in shambles. Maybe in some cases it's a complete rebuild. Maybe for you it's just a room or two that you know, you've been putting off, that you know you need to, to, to get to work on. But all of us have areas in our lives that need rebuilding. You know, areas maybe where we've given into a particular sin or a sinful lifestyle, and maybe you've had to deal with some of the consequences of that. And those consequences are, are actually God's discipline to help bring us to a place where we recognize we need to rebuild our relationship with Christ. Some of you maybe have drifted out of a serious relationship with Christ uh, to one that uh, is non-existent. Maybe you've abandoned the Lord, kind of like Israel did, and, and basically stopping their, their, their worship, their sacrifices, um, all the festivals, and then beginning to worship the, the gods and idols of, of other countries. They abandoned God, and that's why they were in captivity. And some of you maybe are here today because you know something in your life has been torn down. The reason something has to be rebuilt is because something has been destroyed or something has been damaged. And maybe some of you spiritually have been torn down and you feel the need to, to start rebuilding in your life. I shared last month when I spoke that um, I was having a lunch with a gentleman that came to one of my funerals. And he uh, got my number somehow and called and said, would you do you know, a breakfast or a lunch with me? I, I just need uh, some, somebody to talk to and your message really connected. And so we went out and uh, he was a man who, who needed to have some things rebuilt in his life, his marriage. Was, was failing. His wife was divorcing him. Uh, he had some financial uh, hardships and things had fallen, fallen out of order there. And, uh, but God was getting a hold of him to realize that the most important thing he needed to rebuild, even more important than his marriage, even more important than his job, was to rebuild his relationship with Christ. You know, he had roots of faith in his background. And sometimes God does that with us. You know, he, he, it does, sometimes it takes some extreme circumstances, some painful circumstances to get us to the point where we realize that we need to allow God to rebuild us from the inside out. Sometimes he uses trials. Uh, and for the nation of Israel, being in captivity, talking about being in chains, amazing grace, right? Um, they had to uh, trust God to take them back home. And this first group was heading back to Jerusalem, the capital city, and they weren't going back primarily to rebuild their homes and, and start there. They weren't going back to, to rebuild you know, their vineyards and their farms. They were going back to rebuild, number one, first step, the temple. That's significant. That the first thing they knew they needed to rebuild was the temple. Why? Because in your notes, the temple represented what? The presence of God. The presence of God. It's, it's the center of their worship. It was the center of life. It was the hub. And so, for the Israelites, disobedience, idolatry, a lot of it starting with, honestly, skipping church and forgetting the sacrifices and the festivals, the things that were all meant to remind them of God's goodness and grace and provision in their lives. And they wanted His presence back. And one of the things that that temple represented was God with us, God's presence. Even though you can't contain God, obviously, in a building. You know, he's everywhere. But that temple was a, a central place for their obedience and their worship of him. And it was the center of, of, of worship, as I mentioned, to allow them uh, to realize that, you know, worship, and, and for us to realize that worship is not just a small piece of the pie of our life. You know, we all have pieces of the pie of our life. But worship isn't just, you know, 9.15 or 11 o'clock on a Sunday. That's not worship. It's part of the worship. But that the whole pie of our lives, every slice of our lives, our marriage, our family, our, our job, our, our, our education, 
our involvement in the community, our recreational life, whatever it is that we're doing, every piece of that pie is an opportunity to bring worship to God and praise and glory to Him. So when we truly understand why God created us in the first place, we begin to recognize that, you know, I'm here on this planet to bring glory and worship and praise to God. That's my main purpose. And that's your main purpose if you're in Christ. And so today we want to talk about keys for rebuilding because we're all in different places. All of us are in the rebuilding process, right? Anybody finished rebuilding in your life, in your Christian walk? No. I still got a lot of work and still got a lot of ways to go. But there's some principles here in what took place in Ezra chapter 3 that can really help us. Number one is the power of unity. The power of unity. Write that word unity down in your notes. And when I first read through the whole passage, I mean, this is what I picked up from verses 1, 9, and 11 was the power of unity. It says in verse 1 that now when the seventh month came, the sons of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man. And I kind of highlighted and bolded that in the, in the screen up, up top. They were like one man. They were unified. They were in agreement together for, for this purpose. And it says in verse 9, then Jeshua and his sons and brothers stood united with others and others and their sons. They stood united in this task to, to work together to rebuild the temple of God. In verse 11, it says they sang praises and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And then it goes on to say, And all the people, all the people together shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the Lord was laid. And when we're looking to rebuild areas of our lives and our relationship with Christ, it's important to know that others should be involved in that. That it's not me just trying to work it out myself, but that the body of Christ, being a part of something bigger than myself, is part of what helps me to rebuild. And, and that unity, by the way, is based, number one, for us as Christians, on our position in Christ. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God comes in us, but you were, according to the scriptures, baptized or placed into the body of Christ. You're a part of a, a bigger group of people, the family of God. So you are not alone. And one of the problems that happens a lot of times in our Christian journey is sometimes because of whatever issues we may have faced, may have been a church conflict or a church split or a leader that failed and let you down, a lot of times people get disillusioned, you know, with organized religion or whatever they want to call it, church, and so they stay away. And I want you to know that there's no perfect church, there's no perfect Christian leader, but that we need the body of Christ in order to rebuild. Don't let yourself get isolated. I mean, that's when the roaring lion, the devil, wants to pick off, you know, that, that antelope that or gazelle that kind of separated from the rest of the group. And then he narrows in on that isolated animal to go for the kill. The same is true for us spiritually. But our unity is not just based on our position, it's also based on our purpose because we have one goal. And this week's going to be a great example of that once again. Year five, I think Adam said, of a mega sports camp. And it's a great illustration of the body of Christ working together, different people coming to serve in different ways. Some are working with the kids as coaches, and some are assisting, and some are just helping set up, and some are doing registration, you know, and some are working with uh, snacks and drinks, and others are, you know, there, there's a, a place for everyone to serve. And each place and each purpose is important, but the one goal is to serve Christ together, you know, in helping reach lost kids and their families for Him. That's why we always say in our mission statement, it's growing together. If you take that word together out, it's just me growing as a passionate follower of Christ. No, you, you can't just grow to your optimal level without it being together with other believers. That's how we grow best in community. So if you want to rebuild your spiritual life with Christ, don't try to do it alone. You know, imagine just one Israelite saying, I'm going to go back and I'm going to rebuild the temple myself. Imagine that happening. You know, imagine... Um, you know, Dan Marquardt saying, you know, with the project in the back here, getting the Fellowship Hall rebuilt, you know, it's all, it's all me, you know, now he did a lot of it, but a lot of people helped him, you know, working down on Harrison Avenue, you know, for the youth center, it wasn't just a one-man job, I mean, a lot of people contributed, but imagine one person saying, yep, I'm just going to take care of it myself, no, it would never happen, never happen. 
because we need each other. That's the power of unity. It's the way God created it. And for you to rebuild and continue the rebuilding process of your relationship with Christ, we need each other. So number two, we also need to remember the work before the work. What's the work before the work? Well, let's read about it in verse 2. It says, Then Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and his brothers, the priests, they're the religious folk, and Zerubbabel, more the civil leader, uh, and his father, and the brothers arose, and the first thing they built, first thing they built was the altar of the God of Israel. Why? To offer burnt offerings on it. They didn't start actually with the foundation of the temple. They started with building an altar. The first thing we we're going to build is an altar. First time in 50 years they were going to offer sacrifices in Jerusalem according to the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up the altar on its foundation and it says they were terrified. Highlight that in your Bible. They were terrified. Part of the motivating factor to start with the altar was because they were terrified of the peoples of the land. Let's talk about that for a second. You know, they weren't the only ones when they went back to Palestine who were going to occupy that land. There were people who had been deported and sent there and had made Palestine their home. And now all of a sudden, these thousands of Israelites are coming back from captivity into this land, and the people who are inhabiting, they're, what are you doing? Who are you? Why are you here? And they may have gotten gist of why they were there, but they were threatened. And the Israelites were afraid that, you know, they're going to face some resistance. They were afraid that they could even be attacked. And in fact, later you're going to read you know, about them uh, serving uh, and working on the temple with a shovel in one hand and what? A sword in the other to protect themselves. They would face resistance. And I want you to know whenever you decide that you're going to continue everything within you to rebuild and to, to, to follow Christ in your life, you're going to you're face resistance too, aren't you? Some of the people closest to you might actually give you the hardest time about you giving your life to Christ, about your lifestyle changing, about you not doing what you used to do. Because things change when you start focusing on rebuilding. It says, so they set up the altar, they offered burnt offerings to the Lord. Burnt offerings, get this, morning and evening. Okay, so they had some morning, they had some in the evening. And notice how the frequency will, will expand. They celebrated the Feast of Booze, which was also the Feast of Tabernacles. We're not going to get into all the purpose of that. But there were several uh, feasts and festivals that they followed. And all of them, again, having to do with reminding them of God's faithfulness. And they offered fi a fixed number of burnt offerings daily. So that was in addition to the, some of the morning and evening, according to the ordinance of each day. And it says in verse 5, And afterward there were continual burnt offering. So it became a continual thing, the frequency. And which reminds me, how often can we worship God? Whenever, wherever, however. How often should we worship God? As much as we can, all the time, you know, recognizing God's presence. You know, we need an altar in our workplace. We need an altar in our home. We need an altar, you know, in our community. We need an altar in my car. You know, I can worship God and continue that rebuilding process anywhere and everywhere. And so they offered continual burnt offerings. So notice that the rebuilding and rebuilding for each of us starts with worship. Worship. That's what the altar is all about. And obedience. The other thing that's required, number three, is sacrifice. It says up on the screen, true success requires sacrifice, and that is so true. When you think about uh, what they had to give up, and it starts in verse 5, the second part, it says, And from everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, and the foundation of the temple had not yet been laid. Why? Because they still needed more resources. It says, Then they gave more money to the masons, to the carpenters, uh, food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and Tyrenians, Tyrenians who were going to be bringing cedar wood from Lebanon. They needed help from others as they had gotten permission from King Cyrus. So there's sacrifice required if you want to rebuild your relationship with God. And in this case, it was rebuilding. They, they required time, it required money, and it required sacrifice in some cases of, of some relationships or time with, with family. In fact, Romans 12 tells us that we're to lay down ourselves as living sacrifices. You know, it took 21 years to, to complete this new temple. And the first couple is just the foundation of what we're reading about here. 
That was a long time, by the way, for some fathers to be away from their kids and husbands to be away from their spouses. And in some cases, families came. It reminds me of missionaries, you know, who go away and have to leave family behind and kids who go to college. It's hard to let go. You know, and they move away. And this wasn't a seven-day missions trip, folks, to, to Haiti or to Dominican Republic. This was a 21-year project. So it required some sacrifice. It required some free will offerings above and beyond what was normally given. It required some giving what they didn't have. Maybe it wasn't money, but they gave food and they gave grain and veggies and fruits and nuts and figs and, and oils and drinks to these other groups of people that would help support the, the building. And the fact is, what we learn is that if you want to rebuild your faith, your relationship with Christ, you need to be willing to give some things up. I can't rebuild and continue to move forward with Christ and hold on to the things of this world. You know, maybe it's a sinful relationship that you've got to give up in order to truly rebuild what needs to be rebuilt in your life. Maybe it's that addiction that you just keep going back to, keep going back to. You've got to conquer through Christ's power. Maybe it's just things like your pride, arrogance, or selfishness that hold you back. So many things. An unforgiving spirit, doubt, your recreation, your desire to be pain-free, that'll keep you from, you know, adding to the foundation and building of what God wants to do in your life. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 talks about laying aside every weight and the sin that easily entangles us. It's like, you know, I really want to move forward with God. It's like, you know, I'm going I'm to tackle this mountain. I'm going to climb this mountain. But I've got a backpack filled with rocks. You know, things that I've put in there, my sins, my, my weights, things that come between me and, and being able to move forward. You know, I'm just too busy. You know, I'm too busy to serve God. That's a rock you put in your own pack. I just can't move forward, you know, and, and I don't feel the intimacy of God. And, and, you know, I don't take the time to read God's word every day and to spend time in prayer. Well, guess what? You've got to take some of these rocks that are keeping you from moving forward out of your pack, holding you down. Many of you know my, my son Josiah is going to be going into the Navy soon, and He's already starting, you know, physical training. And, and, uh, and so many people who have gone into the service have told him, listen, they are going to break you down. Is that not true? When you get through boot camp and some other types of training, they are going to break you down. They are going to strip you down. And why do they do that? Because they hate you. No, that's not why they do that. Why do they do that, Joanne? So they can rebuild you up to a place where you have never been, a place of strength, place of discipline, a place where you can accomplish so much more and be such an asset and be so much more productive. But in order to get there, you've got to be torn down so that you can be rebuilt. Some of you maybe are there now. Maybe God is beginning to strip some things away from you, no matter how hard you try to control things in your life and you're trying to grip onto things, and it's just slipping right out of your hands. Why? Because God wants to strip you down so that you will totally trust Him and not yourself. For us to be rebuilt, it takes sacrifice. So what is it that God wants you to sacrifice? What is it that He wants you to put on that altar? Number four, we read about in verses 8 and 9. It says, Now in the second year of the coming of the house of God, at the Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel and uh, Jeshua and the rest of the brothers were there. And it says that they appointed the Levites, verse 8, from 20 years and older, that's pretty young, to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. And they stood united, and it says that, you know, the brothers and the Levites, they were there to oversee the workmen in the temple of God. What is that all about? It's all about leadership. And for us to rebuild and become all that God wants us to be, it's going to take leadership in different ways. One is, we need to have spiritual leaders in our lives. I asked the people in the first service, I said, how many of you have a spiritual leader in your life? Less than half the hands went up. I said, man, less than half of the people in first service, and maybe it's the same here today in second, don't have somebody that they look up to as a spiritual leader or mentor. You know, the, the building and the work of the Lord, there needed to be leadership, oversight, people to help encourage us in our walk. And if you don't have one, you're in trouble. And I know why people don't, honestly. 
because you've had a bad experience. You, you know, you looked at somebody as a spiritual leader and they disappointed you, they failed you, they messed up. And that's always going to be the case because there's no perfect leaders. So I'm not going to be led by anyone. And I'm not telling you that you should blindly follow infallible men or women. But the fact is we all need somebody in our life who's a little bit further ahead in, our, in, in the spiritual journey, ahead of us, to help, help us take steps. And the fact is that all of us who have grown in, to whatever extent in our rebuilding process, maybe God's already got a few rooms and a few parts of the, the building of you that he's made, that you're able to help some people who are just at the foundation. You see, because the idea here is, you know, we all need somebody a little further ahead of us, and we, and we need to help some people that are a little below us, pull them and bring them along. But you can only lead somebody as far as you've gotten yourself, which is why we all got to keep growing. And if you don't have a spiritual leader in your life, you need to find one. You need to find somebody that can mentor you, can help you. And yes, you can find some of those in, in, on the internet as far as like teachings and Bible studies and preachers and resources. Um, but it's also important to have somebody that you can sit eye to eye, you know, knee to knee with at a breakfast who will ask you some of the tough questions. Not all of us have that, but we need that. But we then need to pass that along to others. The fifth aspect and principle of rebuilding is the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal of building this temple was God's glory. And the ultimate goal for us, because we are the temple of God, and He's indwelled us with the Holy Spirit, we are walking temples of God, is to bring glory to God. And what's interesting as you look at verse 10 is they didn't need a building to bring glory to God. They didn't need a building to worship Him. It says, now when the builders had laid the foundation, the building wasn't even up yet, and it says, they laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. The priests stood in their apparel and the trumpets and the Levites and the cymbals. And they began to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. Looking back years before when David brought the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of God into Jerusalem. Can you imagine this? The building wasn't even done. Just the foundation was poured and they throw a huge party. A huge party, a huge dedication service. And they're all thrilled. It's like if you had a piece of land and you hired a contractor to come and build you your dream house and they finished the, the foundation. Can you imagine all you, know, you and your family coming and, and let's celebrate. Woohoo! The foundation is laid. No, you'd be like, come on. Let, when, when we have a building, that's when we're really going to celebrate, right? When we want to see the building. You, know, you don't pay the contractor uh, you know, all their, their money that they're owed after they just finished this, the foundation. That would be nice, right, Adam? Right, right? other construction people in the room? Yeah, they, nobody's going to pay you ahead of time. But in this case, they were throwing a party. They were celebrating God's goodness and giving thanks and praise because the foundation was laid. And I got to tell you what, what's the foundation for us as Christians? It's our salvation. It's the fact that Christ came and gave up everything for us and that His Holy Spirit drew us to a place where we understood we needed what He provided for us on that cross. And we gave our hearts and lives and asked Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. That's the foundation for all of us. And man, do we need to celebrate that? I mean, do we need to come to church a little excited if you're in that place? I mean, you're heaven bound. That's huge. The future is bright if you have Christ in your life. That's huge. And he is building now on that foundation what he wants to help accomplish in you. And no, it's not done. And no, it's a, it's a work in progress. But we've made it this far. And he is going to finish what he started. That's his promise. It reminds me a little bit about, you know, the graduation, graduations for preschool kids, kindergartners. I mean, we didn't do that back when I was a kid. When I graduated, from, we didn't have preschool when I was a kid. You know, or daycares, you know, and I, kindergarten, we finished, I got a little certificate, and I moved on to first grade. Now we got to have a big celebration. Now we got to have a big, you know, a service, you know, to honor, you know, this four-year-old kid who just finished preschool, and they got little caps and gowns and even little diplomas, and all the parents and grandparents come out. Now, you know, I'm, I'm being facetious, right? I'm just, I'm poking fun, right? But actually, it's, 
kind of cool. Actually, I went to them when my kids were in preschool, so. And I was proud, you know. Didn't give my kids any checks or anything at age five or four. You know, big cards or whatever. But, but the fact is, it's a foundation, right? These kids are young. It's just, it's just a foundation. And, and we should celebrate the milestones of what God is going to do through our kids. And those little milestones mean the world to us. And that was, to me, what was happening here in Jerusalem. It says, all of them participated, verse 11. Some of them were singing, some of them were praising, some of them were playing instruments. Uh, and they all said, you know, God is good and his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. That was a song. And loving kindness is the, the Hebrew word hesed, which means God's loyal covenantal love. His love, that means it'll never change. He is, he's got a covenant with us. He is going to bless us as a nation. And all the people shouted with a great shout. And all participated with what they had. And then verse 12, we see a mixture of emotions. And many of the priests and Levites, and the heads of the fathers and the households, the old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice. And the foundation, when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy. Do you think this was an emotional day? Man. Incredibly emotional. The young people were like, oh man, this is cool. And the old people were like wiping tears from their eyes. Because the older people, who 70 years before when they went into captivity, they, they, they saw Solomon's temple. Beautiful temple. And they saw it destroyed. And now after 70 years of slavery, 70 years of captivity, they're back and the building wasn't even up yet, just the foundation. They were wiping tears from their eyes. Have you ever um, went back to your hometown after years of not being there? The town where you grew up. Do you ever go back your, to your old house where you grew up in? Which seemed so big when you were a child and you went back and you're like, you know, that's really a tiny house. I went back uh, probably 15 years after I left 485 Cutler Avenue, Maple Shade, New Jersey. And we went back, it was about 15 years later, and whoever bought the house uh, from us, you know, did a really nice job. I mean, the house looked beautiful, and I was looking, and I noticed they got a built-in pool in the backyard. And I was like, I never had that when I was growing up. And, well, I didn't really cry, but, you know, it's like, oh, that would have been nice, you know. Five years later, we went back. Guess what? The house had sold to somebody else. We went back, and it was like, remember that big maple tree? That maple, huge maple tree in the front yard? that I used to climb, they took it out, torn down, oh, gone. I was like, man. Then I went back five years later, the house sold again. And this time, there's like weeds growing up. The grass was like this high. The house was falling apart. That was the last time I'd been there. I was like, I, I don't want to go back again. And I just feel like that's kind of the emotion that some of these older people, men and women who had seen the temple, wiping those tears away. Some of them were weeping, and some of them were shouting for joy, and it says that they couldn't even distinguish between the two. It was just a loud mixture of emotions and sounds. But you know what verse 13 says? That they shouted so loud that the sound was heard far away. And what did that shout represent? What did that shout mean? Well, there were tears of joy, tears of sorrow, shouts of joy. It meant that God still loved us. It meant that God is still for us. It meant that God still wants a relationship with us, that God wants to rebuild our nation. He wants to rebuild our relationship with Him. He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to move forward, to rebuild. And my friends, God may be speaking to your heart today saying the same thing to you. It's time to rebuild. Maybe you walked away from God. Maybe you got yourself uh, in some trouble and, and, and God brought some consequences and, and God wants to bring you back to your roots. Maybe God wants to bring you back to that place of worship and service to him hope that these principles today will help you do that because guess what 
Every single one of us, we're works in progress. None of us have it all together. Some of us have a few rooms that still need some major overhaul. And some of us maybe have some new space that needs to be added, new addition. Maybe God has something special that he's planning for you that you don't even know about yet in addition to your, your house. Maybe it's serving God in missions. Maybe it's becoming, you know, uh, working towards becoming a pastor or a full-time Christian minister of some sort. What is it that God wants to continue to build into your lives? Let's pray and ask him as the worship team comes. So, Father, thank you for this little chapter in this little book called Ezra who wrote about the history of Israelites going home to rebuild. And God, they started with the altar. They didn't even have uh, a church. They didn't have a building. They just started with an altar and started to worship you and obey you right then and there. And God, that's where we need to start too, just worship and obeying in the little things. So I pray that you would help us today to want that in our lives. God, show us what needs to be put on that altar, things that we need to sacrifice and give up that are holding us back from you. But God, thank you for loving us so much in Jesus Christ. And thank you for the foundation of our salvation today, which means the world. We know that what you have started, you will complete. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> Runs out on.